Why did you buy a doggy daycare? I mean, everybody loves dogs, but... Because I love what? dogs. Are you good at running a doggy daycare? I mean, do you know anything about the doggy business? Uh, when we bought it, I knew literally nothing. Uh, but as it turns out, a lot of things that I've made are too successful. <laughs> like really well translate really well into other businesses i so, hate you so you much know. i hate you so much all right here's here's why here's why i think you might actually be successful <laughs> at suing the faa L let me let me talk you through this so you guys you guys tyler brennan owner of race day quads and jonathan ruprecht a uh, lawyer lawyer <laughs> are suing the faa to try to basically roll back remote id and when when i first heard that you were doing this my thought was good that sounds i mean i'm glad you're doing it i assume you're probably going to lose but hey let's go for it right what do we got we got a, it's a long shot but tyler you you started race day quads out of the back of your car just selling parts to local drone racers built it into one of, if not the biggest drone company in the USA, maybe the world. Mm, anyway, a big company, wildly successful against all odds. Uh, you are also an active duty fighter pilot, which is, some would say, difficult to accomplish. And I just found out this morning that you bought a doggy daycare facility, knowing nothing about dogs. Well, I mean, we all know about dogs, but knowing nothing about the business of dogs, and, uh, you know, now it business is up 90%. So it just seems like you pull off impossible things. And I actually think we, we might win this one now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell you about the golf course last year either. No, you didn't? Yeah, yeah I bought a golf course last year. <laughs> it, uh, for people that are like, it, none of these businesses, like, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, but the businesses... <laughs> that I purchased were not doing well because they just weren't run well. And so it turns out that a lot of things that has made RDQ successful, namely the customer service, providing good product, good price, yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, make sure you have a good website that operates well, some super uh, things that people might take for granted, translate really well into uh, into improving other businesses as I've found out. So uh, no, yeah. I've, been, I've been very fortunate and I love golf, and I love dogs and, uh, you know, I had to lower my tax liability, so we we moved into it. <laughs> what I had to, I had too much money, so I had to buy some businesses. Is what the, how I'm hearing that. I would I would have um, rather I would rather invest it than uh, give it to the government. So yeah, or, or I would fight with well, government with the yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, you know, and fighting, uh, fighting the FAA, another great way to lower your tax liability. Um, so let's talk about that, and we're not going to. We're not going to spend too much time going over what is remote ID because we've covered that in previous interviews and I'll link those interviews and videos down in the video description if people need to get up to speed on what has happened in the last two or so years with the FAA trying to regulate drones. That's what's going on here. Long story short, the FAA is trying to regulate drones in a way that we think is bad. We don't like remote ID. We don't want it. And you guys are suing them. And the reason we're talking about this today is that you actually finally filed your argument. Uh, and people can read your full argument linked in the video description. It's like a 70 page PDF and it's surprisingly readable. It's not like just a bunch of Latin legalese. You make some really plain arguments about ways that the FAA effed up and needs to. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Jonathan, where do you want to start? 70 pages. <laughs> uh, yeah, so when we we originally got on there, the, how it works in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, you file a petition for review, and that's what that small couple-page document was a while back. But we had these arguments. We were developing them for, uh, prior to even filing. So we had a lot of these arguments, and there's many, many more arguments we had. We just pretty much picked the best of the best. Um Right. And, we, you know, we almost, if you will, set aside the silver bullets just to pick the gold and the platinum bullets <clears throat> and then made sure we case law and everything lined up. Um, and so then we filed that uh, the Department of Justice now has about uh, until August, I mean, uh, October the 3rd. They just requested a it's typically about a 30 day response time. But the 
DOJ requested a 30 day extension so they don't have to respond to that 78 pages until August. The, I mean, the October the 3rd. We don't have to respond back to them until October the uh, 24th. So that's kind of where we're at on that. Uh, the different arguments, we broke it down into uh, there's constitutional arguments. Right? There's, a four, there's a Fourth Amendment argument is the, uh, the one that we chose. Uh, the Fourth Amendment one's pretty easy to understand that a person uh, has a right to be free from unreasonable searches. Uh, and what's going on here is that the FAA is choosing to track everybody with these GPS tracking devices. And when the FAA is saying that it's like a license plate, um, they are uh, uh, at that point either highly ignorant or they're intentionally being deceptive because it's not a license plate. The license plate analogy would only work for the registration on the drone. We already have that. So what is right. it? This is something different. It's a GPS tracking because it transmits your GPS, right? Like location, right? License plates don't transmit GPS Latin long, right? So the whole right. analogy there is like, you're either highly ignorant or you're intentionally deceptive. And for the FAA to repeatedly say this stuff over and over again, you it's causing a massive amount of credibility to be lost, right? Trust is best kept then recovered. And when the FAA is ignoring yeah. the community like this, and once again, look at what happened with registration, where they ignored everyone, rammed it down everyone's throat, 336. It caused even more of a massive splitting of between, uh, you know, certain different groups. And now you have the same exact thing. And so, you know, for what purpose? No, but it, it, that, that's, a, that's the Fourth Amendment argument pretty much in a nutshell. Yeah, so, the, yeah, so the, it seems like the gist of that argument is that uh, having a license plate on a car is reasonable. And having a registration number on a drone, uh, you know, I know a lot of people would prefer to not have that, but we're going to sort of say, okay, that's that's within your purview. There's not like a Fourth Amendment violation there, but forcing you to broadcast information like your location, like your identity, broadcast that with an RF radio transmitter far and wide, that crosses a line where now it is it is a Fourth Amendment violation. Yeah, well, look, um, so if you go into the Fourth Amendment case law, like Carpenter, Jones, Riley, um, and uh, all these different cases, the, there's an aspect here of where the technology has progressed so much so that now it's cheaper, easier, more uh, discreet for law enforcement to start logging all this and aggregating it all. And that's actually what's the dangerous part is everything bits better than Fourth Amendment surveillance becomes better where and, and so in, in the cases that we looked at that was actually one of the big concerns for uh certain justices with uh cell phone tracking uh with the gps tracking beacons uh with uh, persistent surveillance over a uh a city where you can go back in time and kind of uh, figure out where that dot was right and then you could backtrack everything and then now it, and this is far beyond what you would have with like a license plate reader, right? License plate yeah. readers have a certain distance. Well, because that's, you know, digital, that's right? an argument people are going to make is, well, we've got like, we've got cameras, we've got license plate readers. Anytime you drive around any metropolitan area, it's potential that you're being tracked. They might not be able to reconstruct your location at any time. That might be a counter argument. But you think that that the broadcast that remote ID is suggesting goes too far and is is distinct from that. Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, it's a simple mathematical argument there that the field of view from a digital camera uh, doing license plates going down a road is actually going to cover a small amount of area relative to, let's say, a uh, drone flying at 400 feet, 2.4, one watt digital spread spectrum, right? That's going to go point with a 1.9 nautical mile radius, assuming, uh, uh, you know, it's a low noise floor mm -hmm. and having a way greater uh amount of coverage happening than what you would have with a camera and furthermore that's also in a where you're at a road where uh you've kind of you've acquiesced your reasonable expectation of privacy because you expect other people to be there however this is going above and beyond into private property so it's actually more or less like uh requiring a person to actually install these license plate readers and then put license gps tracking devices on your lawnmowers running in your backyard or your weed whack or your moped. And you're like, wow, this totally left um, a federal, uh, you know, interstate commerce argument. And now you're reaching down into my backyard where there is no actual air risk issue. There is no 
uh, public safety. The only people there are invitees that I brought in my friends, right? So if we all go over to your house and we start flying around, you invited us there. And what in the world does the FAA have to do in trying to protect the safety of a bunch of people in a private activity? Well, you're you're starting to touch on. So the FAA's position is that they regulate the entire national airspace down to the quote unquote, the blades of grass. And a lot of people feel that they should have some private right to their own airspace above their property, that I should be able to fly in my backyard without being right in the same way that if I have like a, a ranch or a farm or a couple acres, I can drive a, a car on it and it doesn't need to be registered as long as I never go on a public road. So are you challenging the FAA's interpretation of the definition of their national airspace. That's a pretty big, that's a pretty big swing. If you are. That, that's a, so yeah, you bring up a great question there. So our position is the FAA did not adequately state their jurisdictional authority to regulate the non navigable lower portions of the sky. So when the FAA created the regulations, they knew what their statute said. Their statute say navigable airspace is what they regulate. And it goes Correct. from the uh, prescribed by regulation, a minimum out safe altitude. Problem is, is there never was a minimum safe altitude created for drones. So that creates a problem because for drones, is there a non-navigable airspace? Where is that? Where is that defined? Well, I think, I think everyone would agree that like if I'm flying in a park around some trees, there's not that's not navigable airspace in any meaningful sense. And like um, New Zealand has the concept of protected operations that sort of encapsulates that. Um, and I, I agree it's, it's a huge uh, it's a Wait. huge reach by the FAA to try to define every part of the air as navigable airspace. Right. Well, they're they created a regulation and they're stuck in a rock in a hard place because they their statutes are navigable airspace. The federal government was told what was given the exclusive authority to regulate the airspace of the United States, which is the broadest. So airspace, the United States is the broadest term. Then mm -hmm. the F was given navigable airspace. There's this little portion down here is what I'm talking about. This, uh, below the navigable airspace or what be is below non navigable. What, well, is it non navigable? Is it below the non navigable or, or what's clearly defined as the navigable? And you, and you and I are having a conversation here. It's more like a step two discussion of like, Hey, let's make the arguments against for, you know, about this. No, the, the issue we're going to like, no, step one, FAA, uh, multiple commenters had raised the issue that this, flying in your backyard was beyond your jurisdictional authority. FAA, you were, you had a duty to respond to that individual who made a very clear argument. You ignored them because you knew that was a very difficult issue. So instead they did not clearly articulate their jurisdiction for regulating airspace in the United States. The large, that's the term they used for remote identification, airspace in the United States. They didn't go, hey, if you're flying in navigable airspace, right? They just said airspace in the United States, which as they've interpreted as being uh, pretty much to the blade of grass, but they didn't do that in the rulemaking. Do, do, so there's kind of like this, if you're outside of outdoors, but where does that start? And they didn't respond to the argument saying, well, what if you're, you know, kind of this below the tree line aspect? They ignored it. So this is, so we're kind of almost going like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't need to jump the gun here and start arguing the pros and cons and why it should be what. That's not our job. The job is for a government regulator. They were told to provide notice and comment, and then they have to provide a response to the commenters because not providing response, ignoring them, is considered an arbitrary and capricious situation, right? And you give me a great argument. I'm like, well, let's oh. let's talk about that because. Uh, the response to the notice of proposed rulemaking, I, I remember the number 50,000 comments, one of the largest responses uh, to proposed rules. Usually these proposed rules, they put them up for a comment period. Basically, nobody responds and then they just pass the rule. But we got a huge effort to get people to comment and to raise valid questions and c objections. Uh, and then it did really feel like they ignored most. I mean, to, to their... To their credit, there were some things they did that were improvements, although some have argued that the typical way the government does these things is to massively overreach, get a big reaction, and then roll it back to where they wanted it to be anyway. Maybe they shouldn't get too much credit, but a lot of people feel like they did ignore many of the arguments in the comment period, and that's they're legally obligated to consider and respond to those. That's not just a formality. Correct. They can't so, just go... 
if you they know, didn't I'm gonna answer you that that's arbitrary and capricious they're required to have a response to a certain uh, if the, the issue raised is going to actually have a significant if it's a significant comma that's the term right there so it's not like hey josh goes hey you missed the comma nobody cares okay that's not mm -hmm. significant but if it goes into a situation going hey um I don't think this works with the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, that's actually a significant comment because there's like actual legal reasons why this doesn't work. There are factual reasons, right? There's, oh, you messed up on your numbers and uh, the calculations that you have are way low and the regulatory burdens are way higher or the benefits are way lower. And so that's where you get into um, uh, basically determine, is this a significant comment? If it is a significant comment, then the FAA has a duty to actually respond to it. Otherwise, it's not arbitrary and capricious. If they do respond to it, they have to respond to it in a way that is uh, um, providing reasoning. Mm -hmm. So we went through, that was a lot of comments, 52,000 comments. Let me tell you, that's a lot of comments. And, and then uh, we went through those, and then we picked, you know, we were going through and be like, hey, that guy raised a good argument. And then you get over to the response with the FAA and you're like, nothing, totally ignored it, right? So we had a bunch of those that we put in there. And then there were a couple arguments we put in there in regards to the FAA did respond, but they didn't provide any reasoning. They provided merely a conclusory statement mm -hmm. and did not provide any uh, rationale as to the that conclusion, right? Because they can't like do a head fake kind of thing like, hey, Josh, yeah, it doesn't work, you know? And they kind of move on like, I responded. Uh, yeah. That doesn't work. You actually have to think of it and say like, hey, that doesn't work because answer it. They didn't do yeah. that. So they, it's, a, it's a whole total, it's a, it's a fake, uh, fake response. And so we were called them out on at least two of those. Again, well, just, because they, because they weren't, they weren't interested in, in the sanctity of the rulemaking process. They just wanted to impose the rules. That's the gist sure. of it. Right. Um, you've, you've got some stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm looking at the table of contents here. Uh, and you've got uh, some interesting stuff in here. Uh, some of the stuff we've been talking about, like FAA ignored material comments, challenging the rules, legality refused to accept conflicting evidence as to tr true regulatory costs. I like, I want to talk about this one failed to explain why homeowners and local parks cannot apply for a free, -a. And for those who maybe aren't up to speed, a FRIA is an FAA remote identification area. Basically, it is a defined space where you could fly without remote ID. And one of the things people thought was, well, look, if I could get, you know, my backyard, if I could get my school playground, if I'm a, like a high school teacher, you know, my school football field, if I could define these FRIAs, then maybe I could, it, remote ID would be more manageable because I could still fly it. But they basically said that, well, what did they say about who could and couldn't be a FRIA and what was the problem with that? Yeah, great. great. Uh, so multiple people had commented, say, you know, providing all these alternative ideas uh, like your backyard, like your local park, uh, city, town and county. Why couldn't they do that at their at their local park? And instead, the FAA basically was like, hey, we're going to expand it to allow these educational institutions to do it but we're not going to expand it to every homeowner's backyard or beyond those two, the, 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 the rec FAA recognized the CBOs or the educational institutions, because that would undermine, that's the term undermine the this whole purpose of the rule. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense there because it's merely a conclusory statement without any reasoning. What does that mean? I don't know. Exactly. Does it, how does it actually undermine anything? Because there is actually no limitation on educational institutions requesting FRIAs in people's backyard. So what if I call up, you know, such and such a uh, university and be like, Hey, I want to take part of your, uh, in your little drone program, a jiggy, whatever. Right. And then, uh, can I get my backyard designated as a FRIA? And there's no limitation on that. There's no limitation on the AMA seeking FRIAs, uh, for multiple locations, multiple parks. Right. So there's this aspect where you're like, you're trying to block it here, but there's no restriction here and you can actually have the same effect. And, you know, even setting all that aside, uh, what, what is under, what, what is undermined uh, mean because it, when you look at it, you're like, well, if I uh, could have my backyard or my local park uh, set up as a uh, uh, as a FRIA, then what's the point of joining uh, uh, a CBO? There's only one CBO that I really know of that, and you have to join them and to actually go onto those fields, right? I don't know of any of those parks, uh, those uh, those fields that will allow you to just show up without being a member and fly mm -hmm. regular, right? You could probably do it once, but that's it. So you have to be a, a member, dues paying member to, to, to join those fields. And like, why can't I have the obvious of uh, flying in my own backyard? When all is said and done, 
if let's say you were to get everything the the the, the supreme court were to go yes jonathan is 100 percent right what kind of a situation what would it look like for us pilots on the ground like what would the next steps be and what would it look like for us uh, the, if the law was struck down, uh, it depends on how it's primarily struck down. Is it a complete vacature uh, with remand to the FAA, uh, which I'm thinking most likely is going to happen because there's too many substantive issues that were completely ignored. So if we have 10 <laughs> arguments that we're launching at the FAA, uh, they're going to have to survive all 10 because if one of those is, is actually legitimate, then it's going to have to go back to the FAA. The law will most likely get... Uh, vacated, meaning it's it's no longer in effect, and it will go back to the uh, FAA for further rulemaking in accord with what the court ruled upon, which could be like, hey, this is a Fourth Amendment issue here. You guys need to create uh, remote ID tracking laws in such a way as to not violate the Fourth Amendment, right? If, that, if that's if they chose to rule on that grounds, because all these different arguments we made, it depends on which one they bite, because the court only needs to really bite on one, and then it goes back. Now, the FAA is on notice of the rest of the arguments we make, and they could try to bottle it up when they go round two, um, which, you know, which is why we intentionally never put all of the, which is why we actually had, came up with a methodology, how we chose our perfect arguments. And so there's a, they have to then put it out for another rulemaking, and then they're going to have to uh, listen to the comments, and then otherwise they're going to- So basically the clock will, re basically what will happen is that the court- We'll pick one or more of these uh, objections that you raised, not not in the legal sense objections, but these arguments you made, and they will say, yes, this one is valid. And then it'll sort of restart the rulemaking process. The FAA will have to go back. We'll have to change the rule to comply with the argument, if you will. And then they'll have to do another comment period, another NPRM and so forth. Uh, if it's vacated, yes, they're going to have to do that. And uh, there now there's a whole lot of, alternatives there's a lot of there's some op, there's some different ways that could all could play out but that's probably most likely what will happen my guesstimate is that there are too many failure to responds that happened and when the faa uh ignored that the court will be like no these are actually serious issues because one uh we had in the 53,000 comments there were multiple individuals multiple attorneys that actually made not only just like they, they, it wasn't like a general uh, um, argument. They were actually specifically putting the FAA on notice of, hey, I'm actually citing the specific thing of law. Well, we had one guy that was actually uh, an attorney was citing the uh, Lopez case, specifically arguing as to why the FAA was regu regulating this lower portions of the sky was beyond the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. That's a, that's a significant comment because if it is beyond the the... Commerce Clause, the FAA does not have any uh, ability to uh, regulate it. Now, our point was that the FAA failed to respond to that in explaining how they had that ability to regulate this lower portions of the sky based upon the Lopez case and the Morrison case. Uh, you had com you had um, uh, people quoting, uh, at, oh, I think Cosby, USB Cosby alone was like cited. Everybody, like, everybody cited loves Cosby. Yeah. It was uh, it was like 50, uh, 50 plus times it was cited in the comments. We had uh, Carpenter, Jones, Riley. We had a bunch of different cases were all cited. So the FAA was extremely aware of these substantive issues, but chose to ignore them. And so I could see a court being like, oh, wow, that was like they actually told you the case and why it didn't work. And you ignored I, them. So you got to I got to ask you, Jonathan, I got to ask you. And I think I know what you're going to say, but I got to at least ask it. You know, I feel I've been through this process before. I remember uh, with uh, when there was the movement to reclassify Internet service providers as common carriers, net neutrality. That was it. There was this argument that they were going to as push for net neutrality. There was a huge movement on the Internet, lots of comments, and we lost that one. Uh, it didn't get us anywhere. I think a lot of people feel that the government does what it's going to do that the comment period and feedback is all a formality and they're used to and expect to be ignored. And you coming here and saying that the fact that they ignored us is actually going to be their downfall. I mean, is that it? Does that really happen? Is that, uh, has that, does that happen? Oh uh, yeah, that, that does actually very much so happen. I mean, there is, uh, there are cases that have happened where the uh, federal government has, 
ignored substantive arguments and in the comments and then the laws were struck down as being arbitrary and capricious because the uh they weren't responding and providing any reasoning that that does happen i think the thing is is that a lot of people don't really realize that like that does happen it does guys and so what what happens when um you know when we're, we're looking at this this isn't a situ this is an unfortunate situation because we're having the faa claiming to be uh the regulator and trying to enforce these laws while at the same time completely undermining their position by such flagrant violations of the rule of law because their their end goal may be i would say just if you want to even depending upon how you want to come down that but the methodology is important right the 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 um the ends is important, right? Just as much as the means. And the FAA uh, colored outside the lines repeatedly on this. And so to allow this to stand uh, is a, a, it's a grave, grave situation. And so evil triumphs when good men do nothing. And fortunately, you have uh, regulators here who are not following the rule of law, which I'm for the rule of law. If you're going to regulate FPV, do it lawfully. Well, that's, sure. that's basically, that's basically the, the gist of the thing. Like, does everybody get a fair shake? Right. No, they didn't get a fair shake. They got ignored. It wasn't a dialogue. It was an edict. And so that's what happened. And then we have how many of the other trade groups and other people, uh, how many people are coming to our assistance with doing this, right? You got uh, how many uh, Neville Chamberlains running around in the drone industry right now, uh, you know, making peace with the FAA, you know, and Poland's already been invaded. Look at what happened with uh, the registration situation. They they took Poland. What do you think is going to be happening next, right? They're going to wow. keep... <laughs> and so, well, I mean, why are you playing games at this point when you saw the violation that happened under 336 with the registration art? You go, I mean, with, the, with, the, with registration laws and everything, which are still illegal. I mean, you remember the registration regulations are still illegal. They still were created illegally. Guys, I mean, like, what, what do you think? This is this is um, the modus operandi, and everything was intentionally done. Uh, look at the the uh, the remote ID arc, right? Was it open to the public, right? Like, an aviation rulemaking advisory committee, an arc, uh, an ARAC, I mean, is open to the members of the public. You can attend. They didn't do that. They chose a, a handpicked group of people in the arc and uh, came out with what they did. We didn't get a voice, really, right? So there's an aspect here where, uh, yeah, can you say, well, you had certain member de designated member people that were somehow providing some input you could maybe uh try to even maybe think about that but that that, that the, the whole thing was if you will somewhat stacked against uh, uh certain groups of people especially the fpv industry and uh that wasn't a fair, fair and balanced setup their faa intentionally chose arcs as opposed to ARACs, and they did not talk to rtca or from what we could tell from NIST or RTCA, which they were directed by Congress to specifically talk to them in regards to convening stakeholder groups. And then from that stakeholder group, they're gonna come up with some type of standard, uh, some of the, the, these standards. And then from that, the FAA was going to come up with regulations or uh, a guidance. Okay, it's a really clear, important point because the FAA is kind of using this like, well, we were told by Congress to create stand, you know, laws. And it's like, no, 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 no. When you actually read the law, it says something different. It's uh, regulations or guidance, right? Guidance, gu guidance isn't law, right? So there's a very clear aspect of where, like, guys, you, you're not being honest uh, uh, with this. I think if you are concerned with making a good rule and doing that efficiently, then you will listen to the feedback. When somebody tells you their arguments beforehand, then you, you're like, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take this into account. And and the, what a lot of people felt like uh, is that they were just steamrolling the process and feeling right. like that will not make a difference. But hiring a lawyer to make those arguments in federal court will make a difference. And uh, as we come up on the end of the hour, I just want to say, Tyler, you know, Tyler, uh, thank you for hiring a lawyer to, to say the things we've all been thinking and hopefully uh, making a difference for us. Um, how are you feeling now that this is this uh, the argument has actually been filed? Uh, great. I mean, I, I really like when we first started this, I, I've meant every word that I said the whole time, which is we're going to do absolutely as much as we can. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, you know, the obvious two being 
how much funds do you have and who can you hire with that? And then what kind of team do you build? And so, I mean, we've built a team now of three extremely quality uh, aviation lawyers, right? Not just John, but there's two others that join him that are absolute some of the very, very best in the world at what they do. Um, and then additionally, we've also, because we've been working on this for so long, and because of some of the public outreach that we're doing on videos like this, uh, we've had numerous lawyers uh, reach out to us and help pro bono. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the stuff that we've done, right? I mean, we really, we, he raises 24 different arguments in the opening brief. Um, and all of those have been vetted by a team of at least seven lawyers, some paid, some pro bono, going back and forth, arguing, playing devil's advocate, and going uh, you know, through all this. Um, so the whole process, you know, while, while I knew that uh, I was going to do the best that I could and we would do a good job and we would put up a fight, uh, I have to say that I'm like just really, really impressed um, with Jonathan mainly and, and really the whole team on how they've really banded together and, and, and put together what I feel is an, a really a extraordinary um, brief and not just a brief, but uh, uh, a plan for the future because, right, we made 24 different arguments. There is a clause saying that, hey, if you're a court and you can choose not to rule on the Fourth Amendment, do not rule on the Fourth Amendment. If you that they might see, okay, this is the fourth main issue. Oh boy, if I say that they reply to the comments, then I'm going to have to rule on that. And I know that that's going to cause problems throughout the whole ripple effect, right? Um, mm-hmm. Then that is why we have some of that low-hanging fruit in there. That's why there's 24 arguments. The court just needs to pick one. That's what you're saying is that, number one, that you have, you have structured this argument in a way that kind of, a, encourages the court to pick one of the low hanging fruit, but that still gives you a win. And then number two, if the court does pick one of the low hanging fruit, that's still 23 other arguments. And if the FAA goes, okay, fine, we got this technicality out of the way, you're not just going to go away. You've got 23 other arrows in your quiver then, and they're going to have to keep dealing with this until hopefully they give us something that works better for us. Absolutely. And that's what I said from the very beginning, right? Like, like, I recognize that for drones as a whole to move forward, there needs to be some system in place, some regulation, whatever. That system does not and should not uh, inflict a host of issues upon people that are A, doing nothing wrong, and B, hobbyists, right? Little Timmy next door flying his air hogs in his backyard should not have to throw a broadcast module that some you know, whoever a mile away can see that little team is flying his air hogs again. And that's right. That's just one of the things. Okay. But, but that is, that is our goal here is that what we're doing as hobbyists, we can continue to do uninflicted as we've done for a very, very long time without having any safety issues. This is one of the safest possible industries, especially aviation related um, ever. Um, Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, people have been flying RC for over 100 years. Um, anyways, we should be able to continue doing what we're doing. And if the FAA wants to keep regulating us like we're commercial and we're dangerous, they're going to have to prove that and they're going to have to fight us again after we win this the first time. So, awesome. you know, that, that's kind of where we, where, where we go with that. And then, then there's there's a you know, I, I have to say I'm like just I'm really excited. I, I know that this is. Like people not super educated on this are going to be like, okay, sweet. We won. Cool. And then the FAA is going to come out with another MPRM and they're going to pick out issues in that MPRM. They're going to like, Whoa, see all this was for nothing. Um, you know, like they're still trying to push this rule on us, except it's not for nothing because we've already won once. We're going to go back in. If it's still coming at us, we're going to fight them again. And Oh, by the way, the FAA, they know the lawyers that we've put on this case. Right. They have dealt with them before and they've lost them before. Um, so uh, well, that's good to hear. Right. I mean, they, they, they know. So if I'm having to choose between, well, I'm the FAA. I we rushed through this the first time. What happened? It cost us years because we had to argue in court and then we had to go restart everything. So maybe they'll just take the argument seriously and, and, and come to the table with integrity 
instead of trying to sort of steamroll it, which is what I think a lot of people feel like they did. Absolutely. Right. And, and this is not, we, we are, we are arguing law here. This is not, we're not even getting into the feelings part. We're saying, look, based on the law, you did 24 things wrong. And based on pri- previous rulings in courts that have already, already info. And oh, by the way, everyone already told you all this in the comments. So mm-hmm. um, when nobody else would fight, we fought and we put up one hell of a fight. So, yeah. And that's well, that, thing, yeah. that, that fight, uh, not to make it all, uh, you know, dirty, but that fight costs money. Uh, I've got your GoFundMe page up here. Uh, you, you, Tyler, and Race Day Quads are funding. You've said you'll you'll fund this fight as much as you need to, and uh, but you also are trying to get support from the community with a GoFundMe. Uh, there will there'll be a link to that down in the video description as well if people want to contribute. Uh, Sixty nine thousand <laughs> sixty nine. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Sixty nine thousand dollars raised of the hundred thousand dollar goal. Uh, but of course, uh, fighting a federal lawsuit is incredibly incredibly uh, expensive. That's the bottom line. And uh, so anybody who hasn't contributed and wants to contribute, by all means, uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for everything you've done in this fight. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, finally finishing up their arguments and seeing how the ruling goes. Uh, we'll probably be back to talk about that. Hopefully we'll all, uh, we'll all raise a glass to a victory. Yes. Thank you, Josh. Bye, guys. What are you still doing here? The video's over. Do you watch all the videos all the way to the end? Wow, you are a super fan. Thank you. That actually helps the channel a lot when you watch the videos all the way to the end. YouTube loves that. You know what else YouTube loves? When you subscribe or when you join my Patreon for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned. Actually, YouTube doesn't like you to join my Patreon. They don't get a cut of that.